but I do dislike that it takes it a minute to start up. I wish I could walk in, open everything up, and YouTube would be able to read my mind, which is funny because I'm not actually a big fan of like robots being able to make decisions for me, but in this case, yeah, it's preferable. Okay, <clears throat> how many of you have taken the quiz so far? All right. No one has taken it the full five times, right? If you have, let me know now because <laughs> this will affect it. Okay, um, I'm not going to do this for every quiz, but I'm going to do it for this quiz. Um, just, you know, this is a good opportunity, first of all, for you to see what a typical quiz will look like for me. It's also an opportunity for me to see who is logging in and finding their stuff. And if we have someone not taking the quiz, it's a way for me to be able to say, okay, I need to check in and make sure that, you know, these people know that there's a class that has Blackboard and et cetera. So, all right. Dr. Ritchie's qualifications to teach this course include PhD in plant science, experience growing up on a dairy farm, experience in disposing of dead bodies, probably should be of rather than with, willingness to step into the unknown, experience wrangling large numbers of children, all of the above. Jill, what do you think? Um, well, I know the first two are true. Okay, so therefore by virtue, since it won't allow me to select multiple answers here. It's got to be all of the above. I hope I don't miss this. That would be bad <laughs> if, if I missed it. Uh, how many midterms are we going to have this semester? Three. Okay. If the answer is not three, everyone fails. <laughs> all right. Uh, are we going to have a final project doing this course? Yes. yes. Okay, now we're actually getting into some forage questions here. So what do we call the fruits and seeds of woody or non-herbaceous vegetation? Mast. Uh, all right, uh, edible parts of non-herbaceous vegetation? Browse, all right. Succulent vegetative tissue like grass. Good guess. Herbage, herbage, browse, and mast all fall within the larger definition of forage. And I originally, when I was writing this quiz, just included forage so we'd have four answers. Then I thought, well, why don't I just define forage? So guess what the answer to number seven should be. <laughs> all right, and I would point out, notice it says the non-grain plant parts that are edible and either grazed or harvested would be called. Um, the reason that they say non-grain is specifically they're trying to separate forage out from harvested crops like wheat or rice or corn or uh, barley, etc., which you can actually make into, I guess, human food. Uh, but in terms of, you know, will animals eat the seeds? Sure, the animals love the seeds. In fact, um, you know, for for plants that are not our traditional row crop plants, um, you know, the, the mast is, it would include the fruits and seeds of this other vegetation. All right, let's, oh, I guess I'm not done yet. Okay. Um, what type of diet or what type of foods do ruminants have a particular advantage in? High fiber. Okay, what type of containment is this? All right, yep. Uh, how would I know that this is pasture rather than a paddock? Okay, yeah, the, uh, a paddock, paddocks are gonna be smaller and they're gonna have more fences. They're gonna be higher maintained. Generally speaking, if I show you a picture of a paddock, you're gonna see some pretty well-defined sections where you can run animals into because you know paddocks are designed where you open a gate, you run the animals in, you close the gate, and then the next time you are moving the animals to another paddock, you just open another gate, you run them in and you do the same thing. So they're, they're close proximity to each other and you know they're designed so that you've got high intensity during the time those 
uh, animals are on the, the land there. <laughs> I grabbed this picture and put it in this question. And then afterwards I realized it was the same picture I had used in the PowerPoint. So <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose, but I wasn't about to change it once I had done it. All right, let's see how we did. <clears throat> Four out of 10, I'm kidding. All right, so if anyone gets less than 10 out of 10 on this quiz, I'm gonna feel really bad for you. <laughs> so make sure you get this done. I think it closes the night of the 22nd. So if you haven't finished it, make sure that you, that you get in and finish it. Uh, does anyone have any questions on the previous lectures, uh, even including uh, the online lecture that I posted with the last like five slides of um, of the last lecture. I think, uh, interesting. Um, I think, and let me pull it up real quick. And um, how did any of you go and watch any videos on uh, pronking after I? Um, you know, talked about it on the online lecture. Did any of you find that interesting at all? No, not really. Well, my bucket list is to someday go to Africa and watch antelope bouncing around pronking. But according to Wikipedia, which, you know, I trust Wikipedia for all of my random knowledge <laughs> that I don't want to look at in detail. Um, these especially younger antelope will actually jump around stiff-legged around the savanna. And the reason that they do that is not so that they can be in a Pixar short film, but is actually they're demonstrating to predators that they're healthy and mobile. And so they just think that they're having fun, but the predators are like, Nah, I don't think I'm going to try and push the, <laughs> the envelope and try to, to catch one of those. And so it works out good for both of them because they both save energy. Uh, they don't have to be running unnecessarily. <clears throat> right. Have any of you seen the, the cheetah far side where the, the cheetahs or the lions are in the bush and they're like, you know, I'm sick of this whole uh, weeding out the weak and old. I want something in its prime. Well, the reason that they go after the older and the weak, generally speaking, is it's easier to catch. Um, boy, this is really getting after um, my PowerPoint today. Okay, so as I was putting together today's lecture, um, which was titled Forage Ecology in Texas. As I was flipping through the old slides from my predecessor, uh, he had a big section at the beginning talking about ruminant animals. And at that time I thought I could move this back to lecture one, but I won't. So we're first gonna briefly talk about ruminant animals in a little bit more detail. Some of this will be follow-up or review of the things we've talked about, and then we'll jump into forage ecology in detail here. So um, <clears throat> here's a brief overview of the ruminant digestive system, and hopefully this will pick up uh, on the recording, but I, I think it will. Ruminants are a large group of animals within the hooved animals or artiodactyls. They're an important part of food chains over the world due to their unique digestive systems. While all herbivores draw energy from plant life, ruminant animals have a sophisticated digestive system that uses fermentation to help access energy in their diet. Many agricultural animals are ruminants, including cows, sheep and goats. The ruminant diet consists of forages and roughage. 
Digestion reduces the nutrients in food to simple materials for easy absorption. These are used for energy and the building of tissues. All right. So that to me is a, a pretty quick and easy overview of it. Um, let me, this should show a picture of an actual um, ruminant stomach here. Good stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. Let me back. Each of these parts contributes to the brain. Sorry. They started talking a little later than I wanted them to. Grind it, digest it, absorb the nutrients, and eliminate the solid waste products that result from the process. Feed is broken down as it passes through each organ, with nutrient absorption beginning almost immediately. The ruminant digestive system can be broken into five main parts. The mouth, esophagus, four-chambered stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. All right. Specifically, the mouth, the esophagus, the small intestine, the large intestine are all going to be consistent with what you see in other mammals. Um, <clears throat> the big difference is in that four-chambered stomach, uh, which the, the rumen, and the reason that they're called ruminants is because of the name of the largest stomach compartment, uh, is this giant vat that the plant you just or that the plant that the animal uses to break down plant material? And what it'll do is it'll eat the food. The food will go into the rumen, and then it starts to break down. And the animal will actually regurgitate it back into its mouth and rechew it, and it'll go back in. As a result, it's a slow process, but uh, it's a process that's highly efficient and highly effective compared to what you get with other animals. Um, I do not recommend you personally regurgitating your food and rechewing it. You know, you only get one shot on your food, but cattle and other ruminants have uh, multiple chances to be able to break down that food and digest it. Uh, how many of you have have worked with with uh, cattle? Okay, all right, like half of you. So. What do you call it when a cow's just sitting there and looks like it's chewing gum? Chewing the cud. And, you know, cows will sit there and they will do that for hours. And one of the ways that you determine if a cow is healthy and if she's happy is you observe her chewing her cud. And, you know, generally a cow that's not under stress is, is going to, to want to spend a, quite a bit of time chewing her cud. Now, cattle are not the only animals that are ruminants. Uh, sheep, um, antelopes, and they're, they're defined as goat antelopes, just meaning that it's the entire family that includes goats and antelopes and just about everything in between. And deer are all ruminant animals. Um, as I mentioned before in the previous uh, lecture, uh, most animals, even ruminants, are unable to break down lignin to any appreciable extent because uh, the bonds are too tough to break down. But the real place that ruminants tend to uh, be favored over non-ruminants is in cellulose. So uh, we mentioned the other day that you know glucose and sucrose are really easy to break down. Uh, sucrose is just table sugar. Starch is also relatively easy to break down and Starch is, if you buy cornstarch at the store or potato starch, that's just a refined form of starch that we often use in our, in our cooking and which is rapidly converted into the body back into sugars. Cellulose is cotton fibers. Uh, if we wanted to give you a good example of uh, what cellulose fibers look like. And imagine trying to chew, swallow, and digest cotton fibers now, cows can digest cotton fibers just fine. Uh, you know, we as people and non-ruminant animals have a much harder time digesting these uh, fibrous materials here. Ruminants provide a lot of uh, benefits for forage-based agriculture. Uh, we get milk and uh, milk products from them. 
Uh, we get wool, leather, mohair from them. Um, they're important for fertilizer, fuel, medicines, recreation, et cetera. So uh, here's one example of recreation. Here's, here's a guy riding. Interestingly enough, and not a lot of people know this, horses are non-ruminants. However, unicorns are ruminants. So if anyone ever asks you what's the difference between a horse and a unicorn, it's actually the fact that one is a ruminant animal. So um, agriculture based on forages is practiced in a lot of areas where other agriculture is not successful. Uh, I actually, <clears throat> I've got a couple of interesting short clips here from a crop physiologist. Uh, he was actually my advisor when I was doing my master's degree, talking about the relative water consumption for animal products versus plant products. And in my crop physiology class, those of you who've taken crop physiology from me may have heard me talk about the amount of water that we use for feed and food dramatically outstrips the amount of water that we use for, you know, for washing dishes or uh, flushing toilets or taking showers, et cetera. Um, in fact, one of the biggest consumers of water is the production of uh, grass for feed and alfalfa for feed, et cetera. Um, however, with that said, I'm also going to say that um, production with uh, ruminants can be very efficient and uh, can be very environmentally positive, generally speaking. And so it feels kind of like we're we're talking out of both sides of our mouth here. So be thinking of why that is. Why is it that I say that animal production uses vast quantities of water and yet animal production can be highly water efficient compared to other types of production. So be thinking of that. And I'm gonna use that as a kickoff to, to this uh, video real quick. Let me see what the timestamps are on these. 226, 930. So I'll, we'll watch them separately here. Eight has a bigger impact on the environment than the cars we drive. Eating a hamburger is equivalent in water use to taking an 80-minute shower. All right. How many of you like hamburgers? I like hamburgers. How many of you, when you're eating that hamburger, think this is the equivalent amount of water consumption to taking an 80-minute shower? Okay, well, now the next time you're eating a hamburger, you think of that, all right? <laughs> so also be thinking, how, how can that possibly be? To understand where water goes, it's useful to review the Earth's water cycle. As you can see from the globe, 70% of the planet's surface is oceans, 30% is land. So the water cycle starts with one fundamental thing. The sun shines on the oceans and water evaporates. This is an amazing process. All the salts are left behind. The, it's distilled water coming out of the ocean. Anybody that has boiled a pot of water on their stove to dryness knows it takes an enormous amount of energy to evaporate water. The sun does this every day for free. No fossil fuels, no fancy apparatus. Here's an amazing fact. More sun shines on the earth in an hour than all of the people use in a year. All right, I'm gonna pause it there because I wanna to jump to the other portion of his, his talk here. We'll get up each day, my colleagues in animal science, my colleagues in plant science, and work to make water use efficiency in agriculture better. But small changes in our diets can have a much bigger effect than years of our research. Please think about your global footprint the next time 
you think about putting food in the garbage disposal. Please think about that mustard seed and those fossil aquifers and consider eating less meat. All right, I'm gonna pause it there. I'm not telling you to be a vegetarian, although if you are, I've, I don't have a problem with that either. <laughs> I, I was going to joke about, I'm pretty certain we don't have any vegans in the class because they'd have told me by now, but I, <laughs> you know, I, that, that's not entirely true, but you know, poor, poor vegans and CrossFit people really get the short end when people are, are joking about wanting to, 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 to tell about it. Um, so that brings up the question, when he says we're using all of this water for, uh, for an animal, how is he coming up with that number? So um, I uh, did some math here so that you didn't have to. Um, I just thought it would be interesting for you to see the quantities that we're dealing with here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you have a 1200 pound beef steer or uh, 545 kilogram beef steer, it's going to consume a total of 4,200 kilograms of dry feed over its lifetime and 20,000 kilograms of water in its lifetime. So that seems like a lot of water, doesn't it? Um, you know, that's essentially um, 40 times as much water as the animal weighs. However, that's just a small fraction of the actual water associated with growing that animal. So pull out your pencils, pull out your calculators. Let's do some math and see what kind of numbers we get here. It turns out that crops require about 300 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry biomass. Uh, in English terms, that's 300 pounds of water per pound of dry biomass. So I need, let's see, I'm sorry to pick on you, CJ, but I will anyway. CJ, would you be willing to do it in pounds and then everyone else? And let's see, who, who else is good at math? Tyler, do you want to do it? <laughs> okay. um, all right, CJ, you did it, do it in pounds. A couple of others in the class try doing it in pounds and then everyone else try doing it in kilograms real quick. And we'll check the math from pounds to kilograms at the end. But what we want to figure out is first of all, how much water is consumed just by virtue of the fact that the plants are using the water to grow and then the animal is eating the plant. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to take this 4,200 kilograms of dry feed. We're gonna have to multiply it by 300 kilograms of water per kilogram of dry biomass. Um, and those of you who are doing pounds are going to have to, first of all, this. 4,200 kilograms, that's gonna be about 10,000 pounds. Multiply that by 300. So Mark set go. Do, 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 do. I ought to see lots of people typing stuff on their calculators or writing really fast here. So 4,200 times 300, I'm just gonna say that is gonna be, let's see, four, six, seven, uh, about 1.26 million ish. Am I way off on that or? All right, woo. All right, what did you get CJ on the, on the pounds? It's probably, if it's 1.26 on the million on the kilograms, is it about 3 million pounds? Okay, awesome. So, that same animal, which just consumed 20,000 kilograms of water by drinking it, also indirectly consumed the equivalent of almost 1.3 million kilograms of water just by the food that it ate. So if we take this animal and compartmentalize it down to a quarter pounder, we're using a lot of gallons of water just for the meat that comes out of that hamburger. So, and that, this, to my mind, unless I've made a mistake several times in my crop physiology class, I don't think that there are any large errors in this math here. 
So, you know, when Dr. Bugby says that eating a hamburger is the equivalent of taking an 80 minute shower, the consumption of water that led into that 80 minute shower was equivalent to uh, the amount of water consumption uh, of eating a, a quarter pound hamburger there. So how is it then that I say that you know, on the one hand, animals use a ton of water and yet they're highly water efficient in production systems? Any ideas? Boy, I am tempted to not give you the answer and then we'll just all have to stew about it until next Monday. But I'll give you the answer because I'm terrible at keeping secrets. The reason is that animals can be grown, can be grown, animals can be raised in places that we cannot put field crops because uh, the land's not as good, uh, the yields aren't going to be as good, uh, we're not going to be able to harvest it in the same way. And essentially, the animals act as our harvesting system in these cases. We aren't applying any water to it. Uh, the water that it's getting is from rainfall. And essentially this is, yeah, those plants use a lot of water, but that's water that wasn't captured by us in the first place. And the animals offer a lot back in return. Um, they help fertilize those areas. Um, they, they help with some types of weed control. And so, they bring a lot of value, particularly in moderate to marginal quality land. So how many of you are blown away by the amount of water that animals consume? Okay, good. <laughs> You're paying attention. <laughs> that, that's exciting. Um, the main thing I want you to keep in mind is, and especially you'll see this as we are talking about forage management systems here in West Texas, if you've got cattle out on a range or in a pasture, that's a very efficient production system. If you've got horses out in a pasture, and I'm not saying that we should be eating horses, but you know, horses on a pasture are relatively inexpensive because they're utilizing something that um, is, is available without us having to put a lot of additional inputs into them. However, um, if you're moving cattle into a feedlot, suddenly those numbers start to completely change because now the animals aren't strictly eating pasture grass, they're eating corn, which <laughs> we are harvesting and we are spending a lot more water in the production of that corn. Um, so just, just be aware of that. They can be very efficient, but you know it really depends on the management system. Um, Forage systems help stabilize soil and water. Uh, forage systems have a big advantage over most of our row crop systems, uh, in particular cotton in this region. And I hate to say that because I'm a cotton person, but the nice thing about forages is that they leave biomass in place, holding the, the soil in place. And so you have a lot less uh, erosion, you have a lot less windblown uh, earth, and you tend to have higher soil or, or greater soil organic matter, more water infiltration, less runoff. Um, and so there are a lot of advantages within the ecology of the, the system to having forage crops out there. All right, any questions? Uh, what are we doing for class on Friday? Nothing. Nothing. Studying, of course, studying, studying, but I will not be here. Um, I have to check in at 7.45 that morning. And at this point, I don't think that we're gonna be pushed. I, I, there's a bigger risk of us catching up to where I am and putting the lectures together than us not getting through the things that I wanna talk about this semester. So no class on Friday. I will look forward to seeing you on Monday. I will put together a quiz that I will open next Monday. So don't worry about a quiz just yet uh, for any of this uh, and have a great weekend. Thanks. Jill, how are you?